Well, I know it's time for us to go, but I thought it would be really encouraging if we shared some of our favorite Bible verses that have special meaning to us. Mine's a little cliche, but I like Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I love that. I also love Psalm 27.1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Mm, that's a good one. How about you? Well, there's one that I like to share with my husband, and I think it really strengthens our marriage. Mm -hmm. Awake, north wind, and come, south wind. Blow on my garden so that its fragrance may spread everywhere. Let my beloved come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. What? Girl, what kind of freaky Bible are you reading? It must be the message version. What? No, it's from Song of Solomon. Haven't y'all read that? I think I accidentally turned my Bible there once. Well, you should read it. It's got a lot of good stuff on marriage and sex. Really? Hey, honey. What are you studying about tonight? Believe it or not, sex. <sighs> like waiting on marriage? Sounds like a boring study. No, no, listen to this verse. As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among young men. With great delight, I sit in his shadow. His fruit is sweet to my taste. Yep, same old boring stuff. Oh, good night. Wait, what? Uh, we are in the final week of a series called The Naked Truth. We've been spending the last four weeks talking about sex and how God created it and God's design for it. And I understand that there's been some questions that have come out up in the context of that. So what we're doing tomorrow night, uh, uh, yeah, tomorrow night, for some reason I thought it was Friday and had a brain fart, so whatever. Uh, but tomorrow night, Monday night at 7 o'clock, uh, we're going to do a Facebook Live thing and we'll answer your questions. So if you have questions about sex, sexuality, anything, Anything related to that, um, if anything comes up today, take your connection card and write your question. You don't have to put your name on it, so I don't have to know the sort of weird questions you might ask. Um, but we'll answer that and we'll deal with that on uh, our Facebook page tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. It will be a lot of fun. Um, and you can have your question asked without the awkwardness of going up to the pastor and asking whatever it is you want to ask. If you have a Bible and you want to follow along, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you do not have a Bible, everything will be on screen. And if you don't have a Bible because you don't own a Bible, drop by Next Steps on the way out. They'll give you a Bible for free. So if you haven't been with us or maybe you've missed a week, let, let me kind of unpack where we've been in this series. Week one, we talked about this idea that, that God created sex. God invented sex. God did not find Adam and Eve behind the bushes and go, oh my gosh, in the Garden of Eden. God actually created that. God came up with that. That was God's idea. The following week, we talked about this idea that sex, though it's created by God, it's a good thing. It's created for His glory. And He made the concept context for sex to be between spouses, a man and a woman in marriage. And the question is, why are there boundaries? And Pastor Mark talked a lot about that week, that or about that last week, that one of the reasons there are boundaries is because sexual sin is not like any other, other sin. It actually can be very damaging to our souls, and purity is protection for us. It's protection for others. And so that kind of leads us to where we are today. Because maybe you hear all that and you're like, you know what? Um, I really do want to follow what God says about sex. I really do want to do that. I want to obey God. I want to be obedient. Um, but, but, but is there a way that maybe we can push the envelope a little bit? Because here's what I know about all people. We are wired to want to push the boundaries. And I'll prove it to you in a non-sexual uh, sort of example. Uh, when me and my brother and my sister were small children, one of our favorite places to go uh, was my grandma Shoop's house. My favorite, play, my favorite thing to have was a cheeseburger. My brother's favorite thing to have was a hot dog. I have no idea what my sister's favorite thing to have was, but food was never really a big deal to her anyway. Um, and so, for some reason, my mom had told my brother Robert that he could, not have, he could not have a hot dog for lunch that day. And so, Robert goes over to Grandma's, and of course, he has a hot dog. Now, my mom comes back, and my grandma was awesome. She would never, 
ever rat us out. Um, my Aunt Betty, on the other hand, would, would tell my mom all the really bad stuff and how spoiled and awful me and my brother would behave. So my mom goes to Aunt Betty, who informs my mom that Robert did in fact have a hot dog. So mom confronts Robert about this and says, why did you have a hot dog for lunch? And then he said something that was brilliant. It showed why he was going to be a lawyer and why he is a lawyer and a good one. Uh, he, said, he told mom this. He said, I didn't have a hot dog for lunch. Had it for a snack. That is, that is sheer genius. That, that, that is brilliant. That is brilliant. And I think maybe he was like seven or eight when he came up with that. But, but, but here, why, why did he get there? Well, well, very simply because he knew what the boundary was. He knew he wasn't supposed to have a hot dog. But in his mind, if he, he found a way. It's like, well, I can push that. I can push the boundaries. So from the time we're small children, all of us are wired with a desire to push the boundaries. And it's the same thing, same principle applies when it comes to the area of sex. So it leads to the question that every single has ever asked, and it's this one right here. How far is too far? How far is too far? Now, this will be especially applicable if you're in here and, and, and you're single. You're, and by the way, single means you're not married. If you're like, well, we're dating, you're still single, okay? Um, but if you're single, the question is, well, how far is too far? Because, because maybe you're here and you're like, well, I want to obey what God says about sex. Like, I, I don't, I don't want to have sex with my boyfriend or my girlfriend or whatever. I really do want to be obedient to Jesus but I still want the physical affection. I want the thrill. I want the rush. So, so how far is too far? Or maybe you're not single. Maybe, maybe you're married and, and your marriage is in a little bumpy spot. And maybe there's this person at work who's caught your eye and you're like, well, I don't want to get a divorce. I don't want to have an affair because that's wrong. But, but how far is too far? How far can my conversation go? How far can my flirting go? Like how far is too far? And at first glance, this seems like a good question because it has the appearance of wanting to be obedient, but it's actually the wrong question because it reveals a mindset behind it that is incredibly, incredibly deadly, and it goes something like this. I want to get as close to doing something wrong as I can without actually doing something wrong. Wrong. I want to get as close to doing something wrong as I can without actually doing something wrong. Hopefully, you can see where, where this might have some problems. Because, it's like the old cliche goes, if you play with fire enough, you'll eventually get burnt. Like, like the problem here is that you're, you're flirting with something. You're flirting with sin. The problem is you're not really trying to obey God. The mindset is not, how can I honor God? The mindset is, well, how much can I flirt with something sinful? How much can I flirt with something wrong? The problem with this mindset is, well, as long as I'm not literally technically having sexual intercourse, we were taught that this was a big definition that we had to understand thanks to former President Clinton. That's not a political knock, by the way. It's just a, that's just a statement. Uh, it depends on what the meaning of the word is, is, so we have to define that. The, the, the question, the problem with this line of thinking is, well, as long as I'm not literally having technical sexual intercourse, I'm okay. And the problem with that, if you're a follower of Jesus, is Scripture just doesn't support that. We see this in Matthew 5. You don't have to turn there. But this is what Jesus said. He said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But, by the way, God loves big butts and he does not lie. It's all throughout Scripture. And Jesus has a lot of them in Matthew chapter 5. This is one of those. He says, But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman or man lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So here's what Jesus says. Jesus didn't say, you know what? As long as you don't literally have sex with them, you're okay. No, Jesus said, if you're just looking at them and lusting after them, if you're thinking about someone who is not your spouse in a sexual way, then, then you've already sinned in God's eyes. You've already crossed the line. If you're asking how far is too far, you've already gone too far in God's eyes because God is not merely looking at our behavior. He's looking at the heart behind it. 
Which, by the way, if, if you're here and you're not a Christian, one thing you need to understand is this. God is not interested in trying to get you to do legalistic religious things. He wants to deal with your heart. He's not looking for you to pray a prayer. He wants to deal with your sinful heart. And in the area of sexual sin, it's not the behavior that God is so much focused on, although that does matter, and we'll talk a lot about that later. It starts with the heart. So instead of asking how far is too far, where we need to turn our attention is to getting our approach to where it lines up with what God's approach is in this. And we find that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Starting in verse 3, it says, it is God's will. Pause. About a month ago, we finished up a series called How to Be Happy. It was essentially, how do you find God's will for your life? Let me give you like a cheat that every pastor in the world uses, and this will make you feel like next level Christian. When the Bible says it is God's will, then whatever follows is God's will for you. In other words, you don't have to go pray. Like, I'm, I'm your pastor. If you read in the Bible, it is God's will, then something comes after it. I'm giving you permission. You don't have to go pray about whether or not you should do it. You don't have to do a word study in the original Greek or the Hebrew to find out exactly what that means. You don't even have to come and ask Pastor Dylan or Pastor Mark or Pastor David what you should do. You just need to do it. I know, that's genius level stuff, right? So it is God's will, what? That you should be sanctified. You might say, what does that mean? That's just a big 64 cent theological word that means that you should be made more and more like Jesus. This idea of sanctification is this idea of being set apart, um, designated for God's purposes, made more and more like Jesus. And if, and if you're a follower of Jesus, I think sometimes we instinctively understand this. To follow Jesus is to become more like Jesus. To do what he would do, to think as he would think, to say what he would say, and a part of becoming more like Jesus is this, that you should avoid sexual immorality. Now, there might be some questions there. First off, well, well what is sexual immorality? The, the Greek word there, pornea, where we get the word pornography, actually refers to any and all sexual behavior outside the context of a marriage between a man and a woman. God would say any of that is sexual immorality. And if you want that spelled out more, because I know there's some people you need to spell it out more, uh, we'll spell it out more later. But part of you becoming more like Jesus is you avoiding sexual immorality. In other words, write this down. It is impossible to pursue Jesus and sexual sin at the same time. It is impossible to pursue Jesus and sexual sin at the same time. And you might say, well, why is that? Well, um, because sex, whether you realize this or not, sex communicates something about God and something about the gospel. You might say, explain that, because that sounds really, really bizarre. So let's explain it. When sex happens between a man and a woman in marriage, what it's a picture of is the intimacy that we have with Jesus. Anything you see that God has created is always a shadow of something bigger. It's always it's not just existing for itself. It's to point our attention to something greater. Creation exists to point our attention to God. Sex is a part of God's creation. It's meant to point us to something greater, the intimacy that we get in a relationship with Jesus. So, here's what happens. When sex happens between a man and a woman in marriage, two people who are nothing alike. We get that, right? Men Women, nothing alike. If you're a single guy, you need to know like women are nothing like you at all. And they don't think like you. And if you're like, I figured out my girlfriend, God have mercy on your soul. <laughs> like, seriously. Because you think you'll have figured it out, then the next day, like, it, 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 it just won't go well. So you have two entities who are nothing alike, and yet through the work of God, marriage... They come together in this intimate relationship where there's nothing between them that's meant to be for life. This is a picture of the gospel. How? Men and women, mankind and God, we are nothing alike at all. And yet through the work of God, what Jesus did on the cross through his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, he brings together sinful people, holy God. We have spiritual intimacy with God through the work of Christ 
alone. It's a mirror of the gospel. But not only does the gospel bring us together with God, the gospel brings us together with people. Person A and person B, nothing alike. Yet through the work of God, through the gospel, we're brought together in this beautiful community called the church. That's one reason why we will make and will always make a big deal about becoming more diverse, more multi-ethnic, more multicultural, more multi-generational. Why? Because God didn't just give us Jesus to bring us back to him. He gave us Christ so we could come together. The gospel reconciles people to God and people to people. And sex is a mirror of this. So what that means is this. When sex happens outside of that context, when sex happens outside of marriage between a man and a woman, what ends up happening is you're communicating something grossly untrue about God and the gospel. So, for instance, when sex happens between a boyfriend and a girlfriend before marriage, what you're saying is this. I can have all the intimacy, I can have all the joy, I can have all the pleasure that Jesus offers, but I don't actually have to commit to Him. It's a false gospel. When adultery happens, what you're saying is, I don't have to just give my heart to one person. I can have two kings of my life. I can have Jesus and I can have something else. Y'all, there's only room for one king of your heart. It's either Jesus or it's something else. So adultery, it proclaims a false gospel. When sex happens between two people of the same sex, and this is not a political statement, my gosh, this is not a political statement. It only became political about 30 years ago. It was biblical way, way before that. But when sex happens between two people of the same sex, what is being communicated? Two things that are grossly untrue. First, I can have all the joy, the intimacy, the pleasure, the delight that Jesus offers, and I can get it by grabbing onto something just like me, something created, something temporary. It's idolatry. It communicates idolatry. But not only that, it says this. In order for me to be fulfilled and be complete, I don't need anybody different. It pushes this idea that we don't need anybody different to have what Jesus wants us to have. It's a false gospel. Two other things that are really uncomfortable. We'll talk about them later. Um, But when pornography... Or masturbation happens. By the way, I know there's so much sensitivity around that word. It's like, you can't say that in church. Why not? Because Satan loves it when Christians don't talk about sin and it stays in the dark. So we need to get over our little sensitivity around that and deal with it so the cockroach can come out into the light and get smashed. So in porn... And masturbation happened. What you're saying is this. I can have all the pleasure, the intimacy, the delight that Jesus offers, and I just need me. It sets up you as God. It is a false gospel. You cannot become more like Jesus when you are engaging in something that says something grossly untrue about Jesus and grossly untrue about the gospel. You cannot pursue Jesus and sexual sin at the same time. So here's where we have to move. Verse 4 says this. Instead of asking how far is too far, instead of trying to figure out how close we can get to the line without going over it, God says we should do this. That each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. In other words, instead of trying to figure out how close you can get to sin without actually sinning, Learn self-control. Don't pursue how close you can get to sin. Pursue how holy you can be in the eyes of God. You might say, well, that's really difficult because I got desires. I understand that. But if you're a follower of Jesus, God has given you His Holy Spirit. And through His Holy Spirit, you're not a slave to your biology and you're not a slave to your desires. You might say, well, I don't know. There's just sometimes, right? I just don't feel like I can stop. Okay, so let's, let's illustration. I've probably used this before, but it makes a great point, so we'll go with it. Um, imagine uh, you're a single guy. If you're a girl, just imagine the opposite side of it. Imagine you're dating someone, and y'all are in her home, and like things are getting hot and steamy. Your mind is racing. Things are going crazy. Clothes start flying off, and you're like, we're going to do this thing. And then the girl's dad, who is a Marine, walks in. Are you going to be like, well, I'm sorry, dude. I mean, we're just past the point of no return and it would just, you can't stop. Probably not. You're probably, if you're the dude, you're going to get up and you're going to run and pray for your life that you will not get shot. 
especially if you're in the South, because every dad owns a gun in the South. All the dads just said amen. The Holy Spirit, yeah, many, many of them own, own, own multiple ones. So the, so the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in a lot of ways is, that like, is like that Marine dad. He gives you the ability to stop pursuing temptation and to say no. If you're a follower of Christ, you, you have to understand the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and gives you the power to, the power to say no to sexual sin. It leads me to this. In Jesus, purity is both possible and pursued. In Jesus, purity is both possible and it is pursued. Now, let, let me back up and, and make a point here on this. Um, we have to understand that the goal here is purity. The goal here is purity, not virginity. Now, now, if you're here and you, you've never had sex, you're a virgin, awesome. You, you, you should not have sex until you're married. Like, that's what the Bible says, so just go with it. But, but here's the thing, here's the thing. Here, here's where the problem has come in. For, for years, the church has upheld virginity almost as this idol. And here's what happens when virginity is the goal instead of purity. When virginity is the goal... Well, as long as I don't technically have sex, then I'm fine. As long as virginity is the goal, I can masturbate or I can watch porn and I'm still a virgin. You see where the problem is here? The, the problem is when virginity is the goal, then everything goes as long as it's not literal sex. It's a problem. But also the problem here is this. If virginity is, if virginity is the goal... What happens when somebody crosses that line or something is done to that person? You know what's happened for, for so long? Satan whispers in their ear, you know what, you've already done it or you've already lost your virginity, so why should you pursue that anymore? That's what happens. You make one poor decision or, or someone does something to you and then all of a sudden, oh, you're not pure anymore. Again, again, if you're single, you've never had sex, virginity is an awesome goal. It's a noble goal. Purity is a higher goal. And if you're here and you've stepped across the line sexually, or maybe you were raped or abused, and you're like, well, I can't ever have virginity. God doesn't call you to virginity. He calls you to purity. And you can be pure in Christ because Jesus makes you pure pure regardless of the mistakes you have made or regardless of what was done to you if you're in Christ you can start pursuing purity today regardless of what's in your past or regardless of what is in your present and Jesus gives you the ability to do that through his Holy Spirit and because of your position in him when God looks at you he no longer sees you as someone who has made mistakes he sees you as someone who's been made clean and pure and righteous in his eyes in Jesus purity is both possible and it is pursued, as opposed to what happens in culture. Verse 5, we should learn to control our bodies, not in passionate lust like the heathens who do not know God. That's a great description for how um, our culture tends to communicate on the idea of sex. The idea is often, and we've said this several times throughout this series, but and a lot of the teenagers, you probably get this, but it's, you know what, if you just put on a condom, get on a pill so you don't get pregnant, and um, make sure it's consensual, and you're okay. Why do we think that's good advice? Because we don't approach any other area in our life like that. For instance, um, say, you, say you come to me and you're having financial issues, like you're in debt up to your eyeballs, you can't help spending, a credit, spending money on a credit card, and you're like, man, Pastor Dylan, um, like every single time I go to the store, I feel compelled to buy something with my credit card. Like when I go to Brookstone at Crabtree Valley Mall, I know I can't afford the $3,500 massage chair, but it just feels so amazing, and I feel awesome when I throw the little 10-year-old out of it and sit there for 30 minutes and get a free <laughs> massage. Like... What am I supposed to do to get control of my spending habit? You would not think it was great advice if I said, you know what, man? You just keep doing your thing, make the minimum payment. When you run out of, when you, when you run out of credit, just get another credit card, and, you're, and if you never pay it off, that's okay. Just make sure you have several kids and leave them the debt. No one would think that is awesome advice. 
If you came to me and I was a dentist and you said, man, I've got cavities and I can't help, like when I go past the ice cream aisle in the, in the store, like I gotta buy like three rows of ice cream. I'm having ice cream at every meal. It's awesome. I have candy. I have gum. Like I, I can't just seem to stop the sugar habit. What do I do to fix my teeth? You would not think it was good advice if I said, you know what? Brush your teeth. Come in here every six months. You keep doing your thing. You would think I was a quack on crack. It would not be good. You'd be like, well, that's, that's probably the dumbest thing I've ever heard. So, so let me ask you this. Why in the world do we think it's a good, it, it is good advice when Planned Parenthood or majority culture says, you know what, just put on a condom, take the pill, make sure it's consensual, and it's okay. Why do we think that's the one area where a lack of self-control is considered good advice? It's insanity. It's not good advice. Well, God has given us the Holy Spirit if you're a follower of Jesus so you can exercise self-control. Control, and you might say that will be weird. Yes, it wasn't any weirder back then. Well, like, like, in fact, one of the most distinct things about the early church was their sexual ethic. Did y'all know that? Like, the people in Thessalonica would have been like, Time out, you mean you just have sex with your spouse? Yes, freaks, been like, That's weird, like, that's, that's not normal. But it made the church distinct. Sad to say, so often the church today has lost that distinction. God calls us to self-control, not like Pastor Mark so eloquently described last week, like animals or dogs. If you want to hear the story, go back and listen to it. If you're like, what story is he talking about? Go back and listen to it or ask Pastor Mark. I'm sure he'll be willing to share. So there's a reason behind all this. There, there's a reason God puts these boundaries down. And Mark talked about it last week, but it comes up again here in the text, so we'll go back to it. But sexual purity protects other people. The reason God calls us to this is not because he, He's a God who's like, I want everyone to be miserable. No, it's, it's, it's to protect other people. And boundaries are a good thing. Like, none of you think the doors and the windows and the walls of your home are, like, constricting. Not a single one of you in here is like, you know what, when I get home, I want to be able to go in and out of my house wherever I want, whenever I want and wherever I want. So I'm going to rip out the sheetrock. I'm going to rip off the siding. I'm going to get rid of the windows, get rid of the doors, and then I can do whatever I want with my home. Like, you wouldn't do that. Why? Because you want to be safe from robbers? You don't, want, you don't want rabid raccoons coming and cuddling with you at night? And you don't want feral cats making your bed a litter box? Boundaries for a home are a good thing. Boundaries are a good thing. They protect other people. Verse 6 says this, And that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or a sister. Every single time sex goes outside the boundaries of what God says, it brings baggage into someone else's life. So, so let's, let's, let's walk through, through a, few, a few ideas there. Um, first off, like, Obviously, if you've been the victim of rape or abuse or you were molested or you're sexually harassed, that creates baggage in your life that you have to deal with. And God can deal with it. But you have that baggage. Why? Because someone believed that sex was their God and they would do whatever they wanted to. But it's not just for you, it's also for your spouse because if you get married, guess what? You're going to have to navigate that conversation because that negative thing that happened to you will have an impact on, on your sex life in marriage and you'll have to navigate that. And, there's, and God can uh, infuse much grace and much forgiveness and much mercy into that situation. But the baggage is, is there. Why? Because someone took advantage of you. Even if it's consensual, that introduces baggage in, in, into four people's life. It introduces baggage into your life because you'll have regret over that. It introduces baggage into your partner's life because of the regret, regret that they'll have, especially after you break up with them. It introduces baggage into their future spouse's life who is now going to have to deal with the baggage you put into their life. And it puts baggage into your future spouse's life because of the baggage you brought in that now you're going to have to deal with. Now, please, please, please don't misunderstand me. Please do not misunderstand me. 
God can forgive anything. God does forgive. God's grace is infinite. His forgiveness is infinite. His mercy is infinite. But the reality is when, the, when sex goes outside the boundaries, baggage is the result. By the way, here, if, if, if you're single, you want to get married one day, thinking about getting married, all that sort of stuff, um, l- 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 let me advise this. Um, man, you need to be totally transparent with, with, with someone before you marry them. And I say, well, why, why, why do I need to do that? Because if you marry them, you're going to be one flesh. That's what Scripture teaches. And what's a part of you is going to become a part of them, and what's a part of them is going to be a part of you. And whether you realize it or not, this stuff that's happened in your past, it will have an impact. And you need, and you need to go ahead and get it all out there before you're married so you can deal with it then. And I know the worry is, well, what if they don't like me anymore? Listen, if they're, if they're a follower of Jesus and they understand the depths of God's grace, they'll say, you know what? I don't like it, but God forgave you, so I'm going to forgive you. And by the way, if you're the type of person who's like, well, I just couldn't ever be with someone who'd been with somebody else sexually, do you realize how unbelievably arrogant that is in light of what God has forgiven you? Honestly, because you offended God a whole heck of a lot more than you could ever imagine, and yet he still says, I love you, you're my child, come back into my kingdom. And if you can't extend the same forgiveness to somebody else, you just don't have a good understanding of the grace and mercy of God. Porn introduces baggage because it warps your mind. Adultery introduces baggage, and and not just in your life, but in the life of your spouse and your family. It can rip a family apart. Anytime sex goes outside these boundaries God puts down, it causes baggage. And here's what God's response to it is. Verse 6, he says, The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. When you take sex outside the boundaries that God says it should be in, it takes God off. It makes God mad. God's not okay with it. And to hear God's boundaries and say, eh, I'm going to keep trucking the way that I want to truck, you you are setting yourself up for the wrath of God. Well, like here, here's what literally happens. When you say, God, I hear what you're saying, but I want to do my things, well, what you're saying is, okay, God, you're there, I'm you're here, uh, you're, I'm here, you're there, here's the line, this is my thing, come and get me. That's what you're saying, which is a really dumb thing to say to God because he's bigger than you. Way bigger. So he can run you down. But he doesn't want to run you down in anger. He wants to run you down so he can bring you back to him. And not just in a salvation sense, but also if you're a follower of Christ and you've strayed and you're you're walking outside of these boundaries, God wants to discipline you so that you'll come back to him. Because it's not just somebody else's life that you bring baggage into with sexual sin. You put something between you and God. Like if you're a follower of Jesus and there's sexual sin in your life, you have literally put, you have literally plugged the hole of your spiritual growth, so to speak. Like you can't move any further. You can't grow any more because you've put a cap on it with that sin. And God wants to get you away from that. So that you can grow and so that you can protect the other people around you. So, we've been through all that. And you might say, okay, um, I'd still like some really clear boundaries. And I know, like, I was, I was that way because I'm a very detailed sort of guy. Well, sometimes. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a very clear line sort of guy. Like, tell me this, and, and then I can, I can figure it out from there. Um, so I'm going to give you some clear lines. We'll tell you these clear lines, and you can probably figure it out from there. So here we go. If you want to know how far is too far, just for the sake of argument, here's some ideas. Um, if they're not your spouse, you can have no sexual contact or communication with them. In the words of the great theologians of Georgia Satellites, no hugging, no kissy till you get a wedding ring. I asked David to play that song today, and he said no. But it makes a great theological point. I mean, if you're not married, then you just say, well, what do you mean by sexual contact? Without getting too graphic or crude or anything, um, A, keep your clothes on. Okay? Clothes on. Keep your hands above their waist and off the front of their body. And you're probably okay. Is that clear enough for everybody? We good? We good? Great. No sexual contact with them uh, or, communi- um, or communication. What do you mean by sexual communication? Don't don't sex somebody who's not your spouse. 
Like, don't send nude photos. By the way, even if you're married, the wisdom of that is highly debatable. Because we've all received a text message from the wrong person before. Like one time I sent a text that I thought was to Grace um, because I saw her name pop up and I was was like, I love you. Then Mark texts back, I love you too. And I'm like, well, that's embarrassing. (laughs) And I've been on the receiving end of those before. And it's like, I'm glad that was G-rated. Really, really glad that was G-rated. So even if you're married, the wisdom of that is debatable. The point is this, if they are not married to you, no sexual communication, no sexual contact. And if you have to ask, well, does this qualify? Yes. Yes, it qualifies. Don't do it. The second idea is this. Don't look at what you wish you could touch because in God's eyes, looking is the same as touching. Let me define look. We kind of talked about it in Matthew 5 earlier. Um, Look is not, oh, wow, they're pretty, the glance. Look is, wow, man, they look good. Man, what I would like to do with them. That's the problem. Or even if it's not sexual, if they're not your spouse and your mind just kind of lingers there. And I know if you're dating, that's hard not to do, but, but don't let it go sexual. If you are married and your mind starts drifting to someone else, that's a problem, even if it's not in a sexual way because you're giving mental space to someone who is not your spouse. It's a problem. Every affair is mental and emotional before it is physical. So if God has said they're not your spouse, don't look at it. Don't look at what you can't. Touch, because God says you can't touch it, and looking is the same as touching. Two specific uh, applications that we mentioned earlier, very uncomfortable, but we'll talk about them again. Uh, porn and masturbation. I know sometimes people are like, well, masturbation isn't really sin. Yes, it is. What if it's to my spouse? It's still sin. Why? Because your spouse is a person created in the image of God, and by you masturbating, even if you're thinking about them, you have reduced them to a sex object. You've degraded them. You are mentally raping them is what's happening. God's not okay with that at all. God created that person in his image and after his likeness, not so you could think about them in a degrading way. What if we ain't had sex for years? You have the Holy Spirit who can give you self-control. Okay? And then there's porn and I know the pushback on both of these is kind of, well, it doesn't hurt anybody. If you're watching porn, you are propping up a billion-dollar industry that makes its living by abusing women and objectifying women and starving women so they can fit a body type that is not even realistic. If, if you're a dude, let me talk to the guys. Um, if you're a dude and you're consuming porn, would you be okay if that film had your daughter or your sister in it? Would you be okay with that? With some other guy looking at your daughter or your sister and thinking those thoughts you're thinking about that girl? No. Not at all. Let's put it another way. Um, and, and, and this goes beyond like hardcore porn, which is shown to warp your mind. But even the softcore stuff, kind of like sex scenes on movies, you're like, well, come on, is that really that big a deal? Think about this. Why is it that if someone goes up to somebody's home and peeks in their window and watches them having sex, why is that perverted, but somehow it's entertainment when it happens on a TV screen? No functional difference. You don't need to put it in front of your eyes. Why? Because something is arousing you and it's not your spouse. It's not your spouse arousing you. Don't look at it because you can't touch it. God said you can't look at it anyway because that is sin. So uncomfortable in here right now. Guess what? Conviction is awkward. Third idea. If you like it, put a ring on it. In the words of the great philosopher Beyonce, I say that with my tongue firmly implanted in my cheek. If you're not ready to put a ring on it, you can't live with it. If you want to live together, get married. Come to me. We'll do some marriage counseling. I will be happy to marry you. I promise. I will. I like marriages happening. It's a good thing. You might say, well, well, we're not having sex. Okay, I might believe you because I'm a pretty trusting type. Nobody else does. Well, I like seriously, like nobody else does. You might say, well, that's not fair. Well, listen, if you tell your lost friend, I'm living with my boyfriend, I'm living with my girlfriend, but we're not having sex, they're going to be like, liar. 
Why? Because the norm today is you start dating, you move in together, you have sex. Like that's the norm. God hasn't called you to be normal. He's called you to be extraordinary and a follower of Jesus. And followers of Jesus are not normal. And by the way, Ephesians 5.3 says, let there not be even a hint of sexual immorality among you. Living together is a hint. So if you're in that situation, make the changes. Well, by the way, there, there, there's a couple I know that I'm so, so proud of. Like, like they've made some awesome changes in, the, in this area. And, and that, that warms my heart because I've literally like never seen a couple do that before. Like go from living together to, you know what, we're in sin and, and we're, we're going to go do it the right way. That warms my heart. That makes me feel happy as a pastor. So for, for the fourth one, this, this will have no controversy at all. Dress attractively without trying to attract and I'll walk away so the tomatoes don't get thrown at me. Why is this an issue? And by the way, I'm going to address both guys and girls in here. Because this conversation so often tends to be like a slam on girls and because it's handled the wrong way. So let's talk about why this is an issue to start with. Guys, women dress immodestly because we value the wrong things as a male culture. That's why. If we valued character instead of curves, women would not dress to accentuate their curves. Okay? The problem is we have a perverted mind not changed by the Holy Spirit. So if men would grow up and act like men instead of teenage boys walking through the lingerie section at Walmart, women might dress like women. Okay? So guys, this starts with us valuing the right thing, valuing character over physical beauty. And you might say, oh, they're so hot. Listen, the, um, find a nice way to say this. Um, eventually, they will not look like they do right now. Okay? So, so, so what, what, what's going to remain when, um, what's going to remain when they don't look like they look right now? Character does. Scripture even says that beauty is fleeting. But character gives you a beauty, beauty that shines from the inside out. Guys, we have to start valuing the right things. Ladies, you should start valuing the right things, which is character and not the attention of a guy. Because here's, here's why I can promise you. If you dress in a certain way to get the attention of a guy, you'll get the attention of the wrong guy who values the wrong things. And I understand because me and my wife have this conversation about every single time when we go out. Because she gets frustrated. It's like, it is hard to find modest clothing. It is very difficult. Especially my wife because she's tiny. Like really tiny. Like we shop in the junior section sometimes. It's not a joke. It's hard to find modest stuff. God will reward it though. And you might say, well, does that mean I need to wear sweatpants and a hoodie all the time? No, although I personally find that to be an outrageously um, comfortable outfit. I've thought about wearing it on Sunday morning to preach, but thought that might be a little, maybe a little too comfortable. I don't know. But, but ladies, I, I, honestly, you, you know when you cross the line. You, you know in your heart when you're dressing attractively and when you're dressing to attract. But, hey, but here's, here's the other side of that, though, ladies. Um, if a guy's going to lust after you, he's going to lust after you regardless of how you dress. You might say, well, what's the point? It can either be in spite of your efforts to be a godly woman and in spite of your efforts to help your Christian brother in this, or it can be because you've chosen to, to be a distraction to him. And I don't say that in a condemning way. I'm just, I'm just trying to communicate that in, in as clear a manner as I possibly can. Guys, girls, we all tend to value the wrong things. That's why we dress immodestly. By the way, guys, you're not... Um, you're not, you're not off the hook in this uh, because, because sometimes guys, when we either go to the gym or we go to the beach, we know when we're dressing to try to attract the attention of women because guys do it too. Guys do it too. Guess what? You know how you do that? It's because you value the wrong thing. You value your physical appearance over your character. Eventually, guys, I didn't say this to girls because it'd be so, so offensive, but I'll say it to the guys. Eventually, guys... Your skin will not be tight anymore. You will have a gobbler hanging down from here. I know I will because I have loose facial skin and I can do stuff like, like I already know it's coming. By the time I get 55, it's, it's going to be hanging right there. As we bouncing back and forth, I know it's coming. 
Eventually, guys, you might be a little chubby. The, 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 the pec muscles you have now, they will become table muscles later. And you won't look all that awesome. So if your self-esteem is built on how you look instead of your character, what is left when the physical goes away? Ladies, same thing. What happens when you don't look like what you think is physically beautiful? Well, what happens then when the beauty goes away? If character's not there, you have nothing left. Dress is an issue because we value the wrong things. Value character. It takes care of practically everything else. And here's why we do this. Verse 7. It says, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. The idea of calling there goes back to this idea of salvation. God called us to salvation. God called us to know Him. And in knowing Him, God makes us pure in His eyes. So write this down. Be as pure in your life's practice as you are in your spiritual position. If you're a follower of Jesus, and Jesus has made you pure, just live in purity. Because the good thing is, Jesus has already made you pure, so you're not trying to become more pure. You're already living from that position. And God, through His Holy Spirit, has given you the power and the ability to pursue that. Be as pure in your spiritual practice as you are. Be as pure in your life's practice as you are in your spiritual position. Now, I know there there will probably be some who hear that and you're like, yeah, um... I hear what you're saying, but I think I want to go do my thing. Okay. If that's you, then then this is what you need to hear. Verse 8, Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being. In other words, this is not Pastor Dillon's ideas. This is not a concept I came up with while I was meditating. Whoever rejects this instruction rejects God, the very God who gives you His Holy Spirit. That's what this comes down to is whether or not you can hear God's Word and say, you know what, perhaps it's difficult, but God, I'm going to trust you to enable me to live in purity. Like, that, that, that's, like that's the only optional response for a follower. Like, that's the only response that is an option for a follower of Jesus. Because if the response is, yeah, I hear that, and I'm going to go do my own thing, then you're rejecting the Word of God, and there's a couple of problems in that. First off, if you can be engaged in sexual sin and not feel any conviction at all, it just simply means you're not a follower of Christ. And I'm not talking about guilt, because guilt and conviction are totally different things. Guilt is, wow, you're awful, you suck as a person. Conviction is, you know that's not right and it grieves the heart of God. If there's no conviction over sexual sin, it just means you're not a follower of Jesus. And if there is conviction and you're like, what? I think I still want to keep trying to pursue this. I promise you, you will be miserable. Why? Because you'll put this wall between you and your your creator. And that's ultimately the point in all this. But the point in all this is not simply don't have sex with someone unless you're married to them. That's not the ultimate point in all this. The ultimate point in all this is you need to get close to Jesus. And sexual sin keeps you from getting close to Jesus. In fact, maybe that's the reason you haven't given your life to Christ yet because you value sex more than you do following Jesus. Can I just tell you, at some point, like, let me me ask you this. Just just think think through it. What happens if you can't have sex anymore and you've you've made that like your life's goal? What then? Because Jesus is ultimate, but if sex is ultimate, then all of a sudden you can't have it anymore, then then, then what are you left with? You're left with nothing. But if you understand that you don't like anything in Jesus, and that in Jesus you have everything you need, guess what? It doesn't matter whether I'm having to live in celibacy or if I can have an incredible sex life with my spouse. Guess what? I have everything I need in Jesus, and I don't need anything else. In fact, whether you're single or whether you're married, the key to all this is you getting closer to Jesus. In fact, write this down. Spiritual intimacy is the key to sexual intimacy because spiritual intimacy with my Savior, with Jesus, leads me to obey God's boundaries on sex. 
In other words, the only thing that will ever make you want to pursue purity in God's eyes, whether you're dating or whether you're married, the only thing that will keep you from watching porn, the only thing that will keep you from an affair, the only thing that will keep you from having sex with your boyfriend or girlfriend or fooling around in a way that is sexual, it will not be, here's all these rules Pastor Dylan gave me and I'm just going to try really hard to follow them. That will not work. If that is your approach, you will fail and you will fail miserably. But if your approach is, I want to get as close as I possibly can to Jesus. If your approach is, I want to give my life to Christ. I want to spend time with Him in His Word. I want to spend time with Him in prayer. I want to worship Him in every single aspect of my life. That will get you close to Jesus. That will change your sex life in one of two ways. Either it will lead you to purity as a single, which will prepare you for intimacy later because it will reduce or eliminate the baggage you carry into marriage or it will lead to an incredible experience with your spouse. Why? Because when you're close with Jesus, sex is no longer about you. It's about serving your spouse. All of this, it all goes back to you knowing Jesus. And what Jesus wants you for you more than anything, and I think we have to say this in the culture we live in, the thing that Jesus wants for you more than anything is not for you to have awesome sex or for you to have sex. What He wants for you more than anything is for you to know Him personally and up close. And not just so He can get you out of hell, but so He can change your life and then use you to advance His kingdom here on earth. And that's what God is calling each and every one of us into. A relationship with Him that serves to advance His kingdom on earth. It's an incredible, glorious privilege. And we aren't able to get there because we're awesome. We aren't able to get there by trying to do good things. We aren't able to get there because we try to be pure. We're able to get there because Jesus already got there for us by dying on the cross, coming back from the grave, and ascending to His Father and making the way for us to have intimacy with God. And that intimacy with God on a personal level will change you. It will change the people around you. It will change a community for the glory of God.